Um, you stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. I stand in the bulletin and on the screen. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you are called. We cannot do this alone. We dare not try this alone. So we gather as God's people. Lead a life worthy of your calling, a life filled with service and meekness. We come to go up for our side in humility and gentleness, with patience and love. Lead a life which reflects your calling, that life of peace grounded in the spirit. We rejoice in our oneness in Christ. We should share the grace offered to us. In Christ we are one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But we are still individuals called to different roles in the body of Christ. God calls us to grow together with gentleness, humility, and patience. God calls us to accept one another by love and to live in community. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing. <coughs> Come, now is the time to worship.
and offer the peace of Christ this morning. Amen. <laughs> I'm glad that everyone made it here today. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a special Sunday at Good Shepherd. This is a day when we get to honor our graduates. I don't know if many of you know, but over 60% of college students walk away from the church. Now, they don't lose their faith. What they lose is their connection. So at Good Shepherd, we try our hardest to keep that connection. We try to stay in contact with our college students and uh, we send them gift baskets, we send them cards. And our high school students, they do show up to church a little bit more because they're usually local. And we try to birth that connection if they don't have it already. And to let them know and to let them see how important they are as members of this church. They aren't just mom and dad's kid who comes to church. They are truly members of this church, equal with all of us here today in the pews. So today for Graduation Sunday, not all of our graduates could make it today, so I do ask that you still continue to keep them in prayer. But I would like to call their names and I would like to ask them to come forward. Jake Garwood. <laughs> Kyle Sacco. We are so proud of all of you. And it just so happens that they all come from the same family. Yeah. <laughs> it is very exciting and an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. I would like everyone to please raise your hands as we pray over them. Dear God, more than anything else, we ask that our children's hearts would be constantly drawn to you. We pray that they would walk daily in the presence of your spirit. Give them spiritual discernment and the ability to see through the enemy's lies and step over his traps. May they always know the great power of prayer and choose to be warriors for your kingdom. Help them by the power of your Holy Spirit to walk faithfully and diligently in your ways. We ask that they would have a love and desire for your word and an unquenchable thirst for your presence in their lives. May their hearts and spirits be tender towards you. We pray that you would give them spiritual insight, wisdom, and deep understanding of your truth, even far beyond their years. Thank you that your timing is perfect. We pray that you would direct their steps, that your plans for them would prosper, that every place you have determined for them to walk would be paved clear. We ask that you would remind them every day how very much you love them, that they would find security and confidence fully in you, knowing that you are trustworthy and true. And in all these things we ask in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We have a little something for each of you. For Jake. For Kyle. And for Lauren. Thank you so much. No. That's awesome. Congratulations and thank you again for being here as Pastor Nicole said. So our next song is just a little talk with Jesus. If you're comfortable and able, please rise. And I just want to explain one thing here. <laughs> I probably should explain a lot more, but I'm going to pick one. So on the first page, down at the bottom, towards the center itself says now let us so some of the words are on that bottom line i don't know what those lines are called because i know nothing about music but but they're there and we sing them so they'll be on your screen okay this is just a chorus
Let us bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word, and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Our scripture reading today may be found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. May God's blessing be upon the reading and hearing of these words. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were calling to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended was the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built upon him, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Thank you. Take a moment and pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto you. Fill my lungs with your breath, my mouth with your message. Let all that I say and all that I do bring honor and glory to you, Lord, and to you only. In the name of the risen Jesus Christ, amen. 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 So last week we celebrated diversity, all the things that make us different from each other. Today we celebrate unity, which is not to be confused with uniformity, two majorly different words. Today we celebrate being knit together in the unity of faith as we grow in Jesus Christ. The God we worship is a Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yet God is still one. Our reading states that we bind ourselves together with peace, that we are one body, that there is one Lord, that there is one faith, that there is one baptism, and I'm going to stop there for a minute because I always like to point this out. So many people have come up to me and said, you know, I've been baptized six different times. No, no, no. You only need to be baptized once. You're not baptized into Methodist or into Lutheran or into Baptist or into, you are baptized into Jesus Christ. Okay, so there's one baptism. I always like to point that out and one God and Father of us all. The verses 1 through 6 today talk about how we should live and an example. What an example to the world we are supposed to be. You see, strong doctrine alone is not enough. We also need to exercise and demonstrate the, pra the practical aspects of our Christian faith. God makes his appeal to people who are not in relationship with him through people who are in relationship with him. You see, the only way non-believers can see God may be through those of us who know him. 
We are God's representatives. Each and every one of us, each and every behavior, each and every temper tantrum, each and every outburst, each and every kind <coughs> act you do, you are a representative of Jesus Christ. The reputation of the church has been extremely damaged <coughs> by people who know the right things to do, but don't do them. Their doctrine might be right, but their behavior sure is not. <coughs> They're often proud of what they think they know, and they tell others what they should be doing while not doing it themselves. <coughs> our behavior has to back up our beliefs. Paul is pretty much begging the believers to live with behavior that will be a credit to God and to represent him well. You see, as Christians, we should aspire to live the way Christ did while he was here on earth. The goal we should set for ourselves every single day when we get up in the morning, you should set the goal with, what can I do for God today? How can I serve God today? Can I live today the way Christ lived his days by serving others and taking care of other people and not being so worried about ourselves? It does indeed take courage to live among those who don't believe in God. We have to stay strong and not compromise to their opinions and not participate in their actions. We need to be strong and courageous, even if it means personal sacrifice. You see, Satan works really hard, really hard at tempting us to compromise. But you see, God delights in those who have personal integrity and consistently believe and do what is right. It is not how we live occasionally that makes us morally brave. It is not merely doing the right thing when, when it's easy, when it's convenient, but it's doing it consistently, especially when it's hard. Remember the parable of the fig tree? It's found in the Gospels. Jesus is traveling along, right? And he sees a fig tree with leaves on it. And he approaches the tree expecting to find fruit. And what does he find? None. He curses the tree and it withers. When his disciples saw this, they were shocked to say the least. And they asked, how did that happen? While this is usually taught as a lesson, and I taught it before as a lesson on faith, I was thinking that there's another lesson here to learn about this fig tree. Jesus saw the leaves on the fig tree and he knew that the fruit was supposed to be underneath those leaves, but remember this tree had no fruit. Jesus went to that tree. He was expecting to satisfy his hunger, but he couldn't. Again, there was no fruit on that tree. You see, many people who call themselves Christians are just like that fig tree. They display outward signs indicating that they are Christians. So I wanted to spend a little time talking about that. Outward signs showing you're a Christian. Coming to church is an outward sign, right? Uh, wearing a cross. How many wear crosses? <laughs> we wear a cross. There's bumper stickers. Anybody got bumper stickers on their car? I used to have the magnetic Christian fish, but the car wash took that off. Did away with that. And as I thought about this, and I thought about what outward signs do I have around me that would tell somebody I'm a Christian. So I got up from my desk and I started walking around my house. Oh boy. <laughs> the stuff that you don't realize you have. So when I leave my desk, I go into a very short hallway into my kitchen and there's a bookshelf. And the whole top of the shelf is Bibles. And I thought, I wonder how many Bibles I really have. So I counted them. There were 16 Bibles on that shelf. Oh, wow. <laughs> 16 Bibles sitting on that shelf collecting dust. Uh -huh. Which how many people's Bibles, right, are at home collecting dust? Now, hear me out. The largest Bible, which is really huge, was from Adam's Perfect Funeral Home. When my mother-in-law passed away, they used to give you this great big, I see some heads on this great big Bible. And then the smallest one, is this one. 
This is called the Cowboy Bible. This is from my cousin Mike in Lano, Texas. And it's the New Testament, the Psalms, and the Proverbs. And the print is so small that I don't know that anybody could read it. Well, Cousin Mike can. He um, actually ministers. He has a uh, motorcycle ministry where he and his friends get on their Harleys and go to prisons in the area and take these little cowboy bottles and share them with the prisoners. But that's the littlest of, it was easier to bring the littlest and not the biggest. And talk about crosses. I just thought, you know, I have crosses. A, a guy who was celebrating his 90th birthday at Bethany St. John's during Superstorm Stan Sandy hand carved us all a cross. And I have, this is a palm cross that we give out to our hospice patients because it fits in the palm of your hand when you're sick. And then I have crosses that people have given me that are beautiful and, and I don't wear them. Um, but the crosses, I have all these signs showing Christianity. <clears throat> the Bibles, so I went back to my desk after counting all of this stuff, finding all my crosses in my jewelry box. And then I'm thinking about the Bibles, and I have a woman's Bible and a men's Bible, and I have, let's see, the NIV translation, the message, the New Living Translation. Um, I have my childhood Bible when I memorized the books of the Bible in Sunday school. I have my husband's little childhood Bible. Um, so we have a whole assortment on this shelf. But then when I get back to my desk, now this is my work area, I have four more Bibles. These four do not collect dust. <laughs> These four I use on a daily basis, and there are a variety of translations, and if you looked at my office, you would think that I was a pastor because there's just stuff all over the place. And then I remember, oh, I also have a Bible in my car. Because, you know, I'm a chaplain, so I have to carry a Bible. So all told, I have 21 Bibles in my possession. Does that make me a better Christian? No. Not at all. All it makes me is realize that I'm somebody who probably needs to minimize some of her stuff. I even have a stencil on my living room wall. It's 1 John 4, 19. And it says, we love because he first loved us. You see, I live in a home, I'm blessed that I live in a home that is, is filled with love. But I wanted everyone in my home or who comes to my home to be reminded that the love that we share in our family is only because God first loved us. And to see that every day is a perfect reminder. And I looked around my house and there's wall hangings and you know, a cross on this room and that room and different biblical sayings and verses and all told. So I have a lot of them too. But again, oh, and I even have a t-shirt. You know, how many people have t-shirts that have either scripture uh, mine says, pray about everything from a Guy Penrod concert. The point is that all of my stuff is like the fig tree. If I'm not producing any fruit because of my faith, then it's worthless. Then it's just stuff. Stuff collecting dust. Jesus says, we know a tree by its fruit. Matthew 12, 33, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. For example, if an orange tree bears only thorns and no oranges, then we know it's not really an orange tree. See, same as for us as God's representatives here on earth, if we bear no good, then we're not really being Christian. <coughs> As we celebrate unity today, we celebrate our differences as well as the things that hold us together. Verse 3 said, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The New Living Translation says it this way, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. You remember last week I joked about the definition of diversity, right? And it means to be diverse. So just for giggles, I had to look up the definition of unity. And it's to be united. <laughs> I just thought that was so appropriate. But it's to be one. To be one. 
So how do we do that? How do we unite when we're so different? Because it's really hard to do that. It's really hard when we don't act alike, think alike, walk alike, talk alike. And often our different perspectives cause division amongst us. But Paul is reminding us that even with all those differences, we are one body. That there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all of us, no matter our differences. We should have unity in our walk. Our walk meaning how we live our lives. It is also noteworthy that Paul is coming back to this idea of him being a, a prisoner of the Lord. He wants to remind them that he is suffering so that they may know the truth of God and experience the gospel of Jesus Christ and live, live the way Jesus wants us to. It's almost as if Paul is saying to them, you better be paying attention to me. I've suffered enough for you. Listen up. <coughs> Pay attention. Live your life the way Jesus wants you to. He says in verse 2 and 3, with, with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So we are to be humble. Meaning we, we think about others' needs before we think of our own. We are to be patient. We are to be patient. That one's always worth mentioning twice. Meaning we don't prioritize our time and desires over others. We are to bear with one another, meaning that we have to put up with other people and their right to have a different opinion. Notice that bearing with one another, though, is doing it in love, not in hate. If we love each other as we should, we should bear with one another, and it's essential for our unity, because without the love, we can't be united as one. Think for a minute and ask yourself, if these attributes that I just mentioned, are they words to describe the people you hang out with? An even harder question is, are they words that other people would use to describe you? Verse 3 says, it maintains the unity of the Holy Spirit and binds us together in peace. You see, we don't have to create the unity. The work of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, has already given us that unity. We are bound together by the calling of God the sacrifice of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit. When we are humble and patient and bear with each other, we maintain the unity that God has given us. So it's ours. We just have to use it. Likewise, when we're not humble, when we're not patient, when we don't bear with one another, then we tear down the unity that God has blessed us with. Satan is the instigator of all strife and division. Have you heard the thought, I thought this was pretty funny, that if two people were stranded on an island and they built a church, that sooner or later they would disagree with each other and what would happen? They'd build a second church, right? Because they couldn't bear with each other in love. You see, Satan knows that we are weaker when we're divided. But God says that where there is unity, there will be anointing or blessings. We're not all going to agree on everything. No two people do. Any married couple will tell you that. We don't always agree on everything. Everyone has opinions. Everyone has differences. We must focus on what we do agree on. And stop focusing so much on what we don't agree on. And all of that so far today really only covers the first six verses of our reading. of powerful stuff. We move on to verses 7 through 13. It speaks to the gifts that are given to each of us for ministry, which leads to unity and maturity in faith. You see, each one of us has a gift 
that should be used to teach others about Jesus. He equips us. Wherever we go, we should think, be thinking what a privilege it is to share my faith with the person I'm with. To be open with others about your love for Christ. How many people attend church regularly and then hear the pastor speak and you leave and you do nothing until you come back the following Sunday? You don't even give God a thought, perhaps, for the whole week. It happens, but it shouldn't. You see, ministering to other people is not only the responsibility of the pastors, but it's your responsibility too as a Christian to share that faith, why you have that faith, and what that, and people say, well, I don't know how to say it. Well, just tell people what having a relationship with Christ, what being united together as Christians has done in your life. Tell your story, because your story is different than my story. My story is different than your story. Speak from your heart. The New Living Translation of verse 14 says, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. You see, we were all not born the way we are right now. We all began as babies. We all grew up. Hopefully we all matured. And I know that we've all made mistakes along the way, every one of us. The point is to have grown in maturity. The early stages, when you first become a Christian, it's kind of considered the baby stages. It's when you're like, what, 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 what do I get out of this? What, 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 what will Jesus do for me? And then as you mature, you realize the real question is, what can I do for Jesus? That's when you know you have spiritual maturity. I love the saying, I am not where I need to be, but thank God I am not where I used to be. I too am growing, and that is exactly what God wants from each and every one of us. Jesus said that we should have childlike faith, which has to do with trusting God the way a, a, a toddler Right, or jump off a bench and just know that mom or dad will catch them. The way a baby just knows and has faith in her parents. That's our childlike faith. That does not mean childish faith. Big difference. See, childlike faith is about trust and dependence and love. Childish faith is about being immature and weak. Paul goes on to say in verse 15 that we should speak the truth in love. Let us speak with love to each other. Let us do all things in love with each other. Let us encourage each other, unify each other, build each other up. We must know that not everything is going to go our own way. And it won't. And it won't go the way it used to be either. Times change, things change, people change. As we speak the truth in love, we will grow in Jesus, who is head of the church. And as we grow in Jesus, we are fit together and knit together. We are bound together by supporting each other. I said at the beginning that unity is not the same as uniformity. Uniformity means that we are all exactly the same. Unity means that we work together as one, even though we are not the same. We should bear with one another at all times. You had to bear with me picking songs that were new and different today. But it's okay. We did it, and it worked great. Matthew 7, 13, I thought was the, a great way to end today's scriptures. And it says, and why worry about a speck in your friend's eye? You know the, you know the verse. When you have that log in your own eye, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of the speck when you can't see past the log in your own eye? <laughs> Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Let us encourage each other. Let us unite together. Let us build each other up. 
Every individual member of Christ is important, no matter the age, no matter the location, no matter anything. We are all equally as important in the eyes of Christ. Let us focus on celebrating unity, not individuality today. Without thinking of yourself, lift somebody up today. Just give somebody a compliment. Say something nice. As you're leaving church, lift each other up. Share your love of Christ with every person, and you'll be amazed at how good you feel when you do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us come together now and pray the prayer that Christ taught us so long ago. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing song is God Be With You Till We Meet Again, number 672 in your hymnal, where the words will be on the screen. If you're comfortable and able, please rise. We will be doing all four verses.
not about the symbols you wear. It's not about the possessions you have. It's about how you live your life. In the name of Jesus Christ, go in peace. Let's meet again in Fellowship Hall as we celebrate our graduates. Everyone, please join us today. Oh, yeah.